Year after year, headline after headline, it stays the same. Some businesses say the Holidays Act is outdated, overly complicated, and should be rewritten to better reflect modern working practices. The holiday pay crisis. Hundreds of thousands of workers were underpaid as much as $2 billion because of the clunky, confusing Holidays Act. Come out today um, to protest about the uh, lack of progress on the Holidays Act remediation payments. Unions, businesses, commentators and politicians from all sides agree. The Holidays Act is a mess. So the last government tried to overhaul it. This from back in 2018. The Workplace Relations Minister, Ian Lees Galloway, is confident it can be done. There's no doubt that this is a big challenge. We're all aware of the, the enormity of the task that we're taking on, but we're up for the task. I don't want to be back in another five years trying to fix this up again. Well, guess what? Five years later... The government has run out of time before the election to get legislation passed replacing the Tangled Holidays Act, despite promising five years ago to repeal the current law. And, of course, in that election, we voted in a brand new government. The new Workplace Relations Minister, ex Brooke Van Belden, says... I want to simplify the laws and give certainty when it comes to the Holidays Act. A lot of businesses have found themselves non-compliant. The law is so complex. But she's not likely to take all the work Labour did and tie it up in a bow. Employment laws are set to be ripped up as the government sets off in a new direction. Workplace Relations Minister Brooke Van Belden has unveiled her plans for the sector. She's looking to rev up the gig economy by making it easier for businesses to employ short-term contractors and freelance workers. Kia ora, I'm Tom Kitchen and today on The Detail, the battle to change the convoluted and confusing Holidays Act and why it's caused so much trouble. Plus, what's in the new government's playbook on workplace relations? David Jenkins is the CEO of the New Zealand Payroll Practitioners Association. It calls itself the voice for people working in payroll. It does things like training workers, advocating for them, and helping governments work out new pay laws. Every day I'm doing something about the hot with the Holidays Act. I was involved right back when it was implemented on the 1st of April 2004, and I've been involved in submissions uh, for the changes that uh, previous governments have done with the Act. And uh, the association, we are doing non-stop audits, trying to help our members uh, with the issues with the Act. It pretty much takes up probably about 80 to 90% of our uh, work is to do just on the Holidays Act. Right, so it sounds like you're the perfect person to help us explain what has happened and uh, why we're at where we're at now. So what is the Holidays Act? It's not just about how many holidays you get as an employee, is it? What does it actually mean? It does cover off annual holidays. It covers off other types of leave, which is your public holidays, um, sick leave, bereavement leave, and family violence leave. So it covers a wide range of leave entitlements that employees may use from time to time. So take us back to 2003. The law change introducing a new way of calculating annual leave was introduced in 2003 under Labour. What was the need for change and what changed? Over a period of time, legislation, as changes happen in workplaces and in other pieces of legislation change, there was a, a, a belief the old 81 Holidays Act had kind of didn't fit the purpose, didn't fit what the workplaces were like at that time. So what they did was they decided to consolidate, uh, revamp the Holidays Act, and that's what we've got, which is the Holidays Act 2003. The Act basically showed up employee rights over holidays and the entitlements around leave, which David explains. Annual leave, you do 12 months continuous employment, you get four weeks. For sick leave, it's 10 days, went from five to 10. You can do a maximum of 20. Bereavement leave, there's two entitlements. So you get three days for a close family member and one day if the employer agrees for anyone else. Uh, you've got family violence leave, which is 10 days. Uh, sounds good. It sounds like there's a bit of uh, you know clear guidance as to how much leave you should get, but it doesn't really work like that, does it? It's problematic. Well, every one of those leave types have a, has a whole set of rules around it. So if I'm a small business owner, I would have to understand all the different rules, how my employee could take sick leave compared to bereavement leave compared to family violence leave. Mm. The calculations are the problem because they're like 
two different things. You get the entitlement, but the calculations might not relate to that entitlement. So the Act's written like everyone works Monday to Friday, eight to five. But in reality, you've got people that every day, yeah, they work every day, but every day they work different hours. And then they might have a different pattern of work. So they don't work Monday to Friday. They, they might work four days on, four days off. This Act works if I work Monday to Friday, eight to five, and I get no other payments, just my basic wage. But as soon as you get someone that's got variable hours, a different work pattern, it falls down because there's nothing in the Act that basically helps in the calculations. There's been plenty of examples of how this has been mismanaged over many forms of organisations, from public sector to small business to big business, right? Yes. What are some that are kind of the worst? Well, some of them are based on problems with the Act, some of them to do with payroll systems, and that's another fact we've got to take into account. There are payroll systems out there that have not been um, developed correctly. Not, not, doesn't, the software doesn't provide the calculations correctly as per the Act because uh, there's no certification in New Zealand. So anyone can create a payroll system and flog it off, and it's up to the employer because they're liable to make sure that the system's doing it correctly. Like the one that got in the news uh, early on was about the police payroll, and that was just basically about there's two calculations for annual leave. One of the calcula- only one of the calculations of the two had been used. Uh, so there's that example. You had Auckland City Council. You hear about Auckland City Council all the time. They've had issues with the Holidays Act, something like and it was about $10 million in regards to underpayments. MB, who's supposed to be looking after the Act, they had something like a $12 million underpayment. There's lots. I can go around to, to pretty much any payroll system to find issues. Te Fatu Order House New Zealand had quite a high profile, or well, made a high profile mistakes too, didn't it? Payroll experts warned Te Fatu Order's more than two billion dollar back pay bill, which is owed to staff, will keep growing because the Holidays Act is not fit for purpose. You do have to take into account a hospital is one of the most complex work environments that payroll would be used in, and you're talking about people working twenty four seven. Uh, they have lots of old legacy type allowances. Um, it's no, no excuse, but I'm saying that would be one of the most um, complicated uh, payroll environments you could have come across. Small businesses as well. I mean, you talked a little bit about them before, but anything else to add on small businesses or examples you've heard? Well, the largest sector in New Zealand is small business. And the problem is they go look at a website, they see a payroll system advertised, and, and you get, I've seen statements on websites saying, uh, ID certified. There's no certification in New Zealand. A uh, small business owner just takes it that if you're selling a payroll system, it must be compliant. So they, they buy into these small payroll systems and then they get a nasty surprise down the track that actually the whole payroll system's wrong because the person who developed it or the team that developed it decided they believe this is the way to do the calculation because there's no direction from uh, government. And the small business operator or business is now facing a major bill that they can't afford. How do they find out that it's wrong and their calculations were wrong? So usually it's the employee saying, hey, you know, I've been doing all this extra work. Why isn't my pay going up? I find it very hard for a small business owner to understand all the rules in the Holidays Act because it's so complex. And they take it that the payroll system's doing it correctly and then they get a nasty surprise finding that different payments had not been added into gross, which means the employee's been underpaid and you've got a liability period of six years. So that means if you've had an employee for six years and you've got it wrong for six years, all that money is owed to the employee. Mm, okay, so yeah, it's not a good situation, but there have been ideas to reform it, right? We've certainly seen, you know, the key in English years thinking about something but didn't quite get there. Um, National did a change in 2011. Did that help at all? Well, all it did was they changed one of the calculations, and that was for the sick leave, bereavement leave, and all the other other types of leave, but not annual leave. Annual leave's never changed since day one, so it's still the same calculations that were in place on the 1st of April 2004. But, yeah, Labor, when they came to power, they wanted to have a look at it. They got a task force to have a look at it, right? A monumental payroll mess, which has left thousands of workers out of pocket, is in the government's crosshairs. Businesses and unions have long called for an overhaul of the Holiday Act, saying its complexity has resulted in many employers underpaying their staff. The task force reviewed everything, got submissions, and they basically put recommendations forward. 
that uh, the minister at the time basically signed off saying, yep, we accept all the recommendations. They're going to end a very long period of confusion, underpayments and big settlements that have really plagued the sector over the last 16 years. The problem for payroll is they didn't look at those recommendations in, in regard to what can payroll actually do. So then we spent the time from that, that review right up to when the, the, the government changed to basically try to put that into a piece of legislation that payroll could use. And you couldn't because they had already tied our hands uh, because some of the recommendations don't fit what payroll can actually do. So the recommendations became even more complicated than the original act. So we we're still going to be doing three calculations for annual leave, but one of them was looking back 13 weeks. Some employees actually get paid fortnightly. So that, that's just stupid doing 13 weeks when people are getting paid fortnightly. And then they were changing uh, the calculations for uh, like sick leave and bereavement leave and so on from now being one calculation that you, you pick from the two to actually doing two calculations. And then lots of tests as well to basically help you determine which calculation to use. The problem with that for payroll is I'm processing payroll now I've got to get the money in the bank by the end of the day. And now I'm supposed to be doing all these extra tests. And if I can't, and if that doesn't work, I'm supposed to go and talk to the employee. That's not reality. So this task force that Labor spent a lot of time trying to put together and, you know, they gave them a lot of time to try and get recommendations sorted. It didn't really achieve anything. Well, we would have meetings and uh, like the MB representative would be there. Uh, we would ask questions and they would sit there and say nothing. And then they would say, right, we need your feedback in a couple of days. So to me, it was more like lip service. And they wouldn't answer payroll-related questions so we could have confidence in what they were doing. And everything was rushed. And then it was delay after delay after delay. So I didn't feel that payroll was actually involved in the process. We're almost up to the present now. So when at the end, before the last election, the last government said, we need a bit more time. We're going to wait until after the election. But obviously, as we all know, Labor did not get in this election. Mm -hmm. And now the Workplace Relations Minister is Brooke Van Velden, the Deputy Leader of ACT. Brooke Van Velden has said, we know it's complex. We've got to change it. Businesses have been doing it tough. We've had a lot of added costs over the last few years. Uh, but also there's a lot of complexity under the law. And I know that a lot of businesses are wanting this government uh, to simplify the law. Is there any detailed information, specific ideas about what that could look like? No, not yet. So I believe they're probably reviewing what Labor had done because there was a lot of work done and seeing if anything could be salvaged from that work. Anything you'd, you'd like to see salvaged or do you think that the task force report was a waste of time? No, I did think it was a waste of time, but I would hope, um, so I should be able to sit down with a staff member as a, as a small business owner or a manager and clearly be able to explain to them how they got paid, for, what they got paid for leave. Mm. And presently, it's pretty hard to do. And the test should be anything that they plan to create that should be tested on can it actually be done in a payroll system and is it practical, is it, is it uh, easy to understand? And that's, that's the test. It should be like that all, all the way through. So I can explain it to an employee. I can explain it to a manager. The payroll system can clearly show transparency on what it's doing. Um, it, needs, it needs to be um, simple. It needs to be practical. So we've talked all about the complications of the Holidays Act, but that's not the only workplace issue Brooke Van Belden has in her sights. Last week, she outlined her workplace relations strategy in a speech at the Auckland Business Chamber. Employment lawyer Barbara Bucket says that Van Velden's focus seems to be the businesses, not employees. That's their, their, their mandate, really, isn't it? Their focus is more business orientated. Mm. Whereas to the last government, they were probably more looking at uh, the employee's side of, of under employee lens more so. Um, and they were more interested in not reducing entitlements. I think they made that clear. Um, both were looking for, I guess, some practical solutions and clarity, and that's what um, Brooke Van Velden seems to be saying. 
What are some of the other changes she was talking about in her speech? I think she's trying to say we are in a, in a, in a different world, that businesses are operating in a different environment with these, you know, flexi working hours, the four day week, et cetera, et cetera. And I think she's looking to see, you know, she's talking about evolving work arrangements and business needs. I think those are the words she used. There's an idea that maybe people won't be able to fight being a contractor in court. I mean, what kind of impact would that have on businesses and workers? They're real kernels, you know, they're right at the heart of it all because there's been, you know, a move at the moment in the jurisprudence of the court, as you can see with the Uber drivers uh, in particular at the moment. Fighting to be recognised as an employee, this former Uber driver took the company to court. We're not treated fairly by Uber. We don't get any holiday pay, no sick leave, no time off and no compensation if we don't get enough money to, you know, at least to pay for our vehicles. The court ruled in their favour, but Uber is appealing. There was um, the Gloria Vale and whatever, all these arguments about whether you're fish or fowl in terms of you come within the Employment Relations Act so you have the benefits as an employee. Well, a group of former Gloria Vale members have filed a claim for lost wages and compensation at the Employment Relations Authority that is believed to total more than $5 million. The claim follows two employment court rulings that six women and three men were the Christian community's employees. As opposed to contractors where it's, uh, you know, just an ordinary contract to, which you, without that bundle of rights and those additional um, advantages that you get if you're employed, certainly there's been an articulation to make it easier for people to um, contract it seems to it, it seems to also have some form of bolster from the fact that the, from the gig economy type thing that people should be free to make whatever arrangements they want to make without them being reinterpreted by the courts as uh, something else. And then and there's an issue about sanctity of contract embedded in that, that if you actually contract as a contractor, that's the sanctity, that's the agreement that should be upheld as opposed to another third party like a court coming into it and say, well, in reality, you're not really a contractor. What kind of effect would that have on workers versus businesses, though, the whole contract thing? Oh, it's, it's, it's major because, you see, I guess the, the, the point is that it, it has the effect of cancelling out rights that employees might otherwise have. So it's, it's seen in that social justice type approach to it that you've got a bundle of rights that are granted to you under a piece of legislation which you would then contract out of. And that sort of seems to be an anathema that you you could contract out when 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 you're going for a job. Um, there's a you know a, a maybe a power imbalance in there, and people end up agreeing to things that only later down the track they understand that they've given away something. There's also the talk of public holidays as well, and uh, we know Act's not a huge fan of public holidays. <laughs> they um, <laughs> when Mataliki came in, they weren't too happy, and David Seymour's even a few years ago he talked about getting rid of public holidays. The ACT Party leader David Seymour is calling for most public holidays to be scrapped, saying governments should not dictate when people can take a break. Queen's birthday weekend's not even on her birthday, so you can get rid of that one. The religious holidays, people can make up their own mind. We now have a very diverse country where people have a range of different religious outlooks. It's not clear why the government needs to tell people when they should celebrate religious holidays. Do you think we'll see it into public holidays? Well, no, oh, well, it'd, be, it'd, be a, it'd be a very brave move. I mean, Matariki again is up for grabs in terms of a, of a political football, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's 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 where the pendulum swings. But I good luck to anyone that's going. It won't uh, take away people's public holidays. I mean, it's an institution in New Zealand. How many public holidays we've got? I think people talked about Matariki being swapped out for something else. That's about as far as I think it, it sort of got. But to take away public holidays in general, I think there'd be a, a huge backlash. Brave, brave new world. We'll see. But yeah, New Zealand has. We talk about how problematic all these laws are, right? But New Zealand's laws on the world stage are pretty liberal. Yeah. Oh, I think so, but don't forget we come from a, a, a liberal background. Parnell stepped on the shores of, of Patoni and he's coming from the old country and said we're going to do it differently here. You know, we're going to have eight hours a day, um, you know, and, 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 and the eight hours of pay and et cetera, et cetera. So we, you know, right from 1894, it goes back to the old Arbitration Act, you know, um, 
New Zealand has had these laws, and, 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 and in essence they have remained it's at the backbone of industrial relations or employment. Mm. Well, can I ask you, I mean, you know, countries like the, the US, for instance, there's no regulated federal leave, is there? I mean... No, you can fire at will there. There's no process. It's an open, you know, it's a maverick world, really. It really is. Are there any other countries that would compare differently to New Zealand? We deal a lot here, and certainly I do in my practice with, say, Australia. And but you know, and there are variances, but they're only variances. They you know, in terms of some definitional things. So when it comes to holidays in Australia, what are they entitled to versus New Zealand? Do you know? Yeah, I do. As it happens, um, we they're slightly uh, lower than us. Um, they they've got twenty eight days, and we've got thirty two. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it comes to hol- our public ho- pu- uh, plus our public holidays, but you see, if you go to the states, for example, they they've just got zero. A- any other comparisons uh, in terms of holidays around the world? Ah, uh, Brazil tops with forty one days. Uh, Sweden clo- uh, uh, as well, and we are about the sixteenth, according to the data that I accessed on the world scale with our 32. So we're comparable. We're not at the top of top of the list, but we're United Kingdom 37. They've got a lot of bank holidays in, um, in, in the UK. You know, compared to with the states where, you know, if you've got, you've got zero, but you can negotiate, but they're all often like Thanksgiving. They're one day here, one day there, and we don't, they don't have the luxury that we have of at the moment, uh, the the years are throwing up sort of great good blocks around, you know, our, our Christmas holidays, our Easter holidays, etc. Whatever changes are coming, it will be hard to move fast enough to keep up with our changing workplaces. Here's David Jenkins again. But the problem is any changes in the holidays, that you're probably talking about two years. So we won't see any change. This is how complex it is, because any change that you do, then you've got to get that information out clearly to payroll providers and their developers and that takes time to then uh, recreate or change the system, update the system, update all the users of the system. So you're talking about two to three years. What we're looking at now as we're moving into the future is people are talking about work-life balance. And so it's watch the space because people are seeing that, you know, we're not a slave to the, the workplace anymore. And the intersection between our personal lives and our working lives is becoming more focused. And so I guess if you're going back to your Holidays Act, you know, it's light years now. Everything's moving so rapidly that even talking about the Holidays Act and requirements right now, you know, will it be fit for purpose even, you know, one year in? I don't know. That's it for today. Thanks to David Jenkins and Barbara Bucket. The detail is funded through RNZ and New Zealand On Air. Today's episode was engineered by Mark Chesterman and produced by Gwen McClure. I'm Tom Kitchen. Ma te awa.